first of all, I'd just like to get an idea of who you are and what you've done really. So could you tell us a bit about yourself and about your career? I'm Alfonso Silva Santisteban. I mean based in Lima, Peru. I'm Inokwanderema, I come from Uganda. Well, I'm Enrique Shore, I was born in Argentina. I'm Susan Rule, I live in New York. I'm an Australian national. Well, I've been in Budapest since 2015. I'm an old Reuter correspondent, as are many of the correspondents who write for News Decoder. I'm currently based in Kampala, uh, where I work as a journalist or a writer. I went to the US to study photojournalists. I'm a public health physician by training. I've been working for more than 15 years now in, in research areas around uh, LGBT minorities, especially transgender people, HIV prevention, human rights. And then I started uh, working on journalism around five years ago. I started first as, uh, as a photographer. I work for the Australian government. I work for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development based in Paris. I also worked at the um, Asian Development Bank Institute in Tokyo, and I was teaching also for quite some time at Sofia University in Tokyo. I um, have lived all over the world as a journalist for United Press International, Associated Press. I've worked for the United Nations doing reporting for them, and currently I'm the blood cancer editor for uh, Medscape. Uh, I did serve as a journalism professor. I have a PhD in writing and literature, but most of my time has been spent in the field working. Um, I worked for 30 years in Russia and was a specialist on Russia and communist countries. Well, I, I guess you could say that I'm an expert on human interest stories. Refugees has, has turned out to be one of the topics I've covered quite extensively. But but I see myself as a journalist and, and I can write about absolutely anything. Um, but one of the main things I did when I was in Russia was to write a column about my neighbours, my Russian neighbours, how they were living, how they were coping with economic reform. So I became a, a specialist on writing portraits, on, on writing what we call human interest stories. There are high school graduating classes that are bigger than the medical illustrator community. It just crazy how small it is but at the same time how talented these illustrators are the depth and knowledge as well because they they have to interact with physicians and clinicians and so they need to know the scientific background they need to know what they're talking about so they could kind of intermingle between both the artistic world and the science world so like their knowledge is incredible but also, I've been a journalist uh, on and off over the years. I worked for a magazine owned by the Financial Times called Foreign Direct Investment Intelligence. Now I write many blogs and articles. Uh, so um, um, I started writing from my campus. I was doing a, a, a bachelor's in mass communication at a university in, in, in Kampala. And that's where I picked my interest in writing. At first, I didn't know even journalism existed because when you're studying in Uganda from high school, uh, journalism is not that big of a thing but then it turns out it was perfect for me because I had passion for writing even in high school I was doing literature uh, as a kid they loved reading so uh, it turned out to be the perfect thing for me. I had a job writing a column for our city newspaper every week when I was 11 years old even in high school even in college I went to Harvard I did not go anywhere near the newspaper school newspapers where I could have gotten some very good on the job training I was just very focused on my interests, which were more literary. And um, when I was doing a, a master's in writing and literature in Indiana, that I started traveling. And really, once I lived in Africa and once I worked in China, I became much more interested in the political situation, people's lives. And plus, I wanted a job. I wanted to make money. I needed to survive and have a career. And that's how it all came to be. I uh, started working with uh, Reuters and I became the chief photographer in Argentina, Uruguay and Paraguay. And then I, I went on to Spain and I, I basically spent almost 30 years uh, working uh, as a photojournalist and, and then editor and manager in, in Reuters. When you work in, in a news agency, you know, one day you... you you are with the powerful and, and maybe in the morning and then in the afternoon you are in the middle of a, of a, a slum or, or, you know, a very varied 
uh, aspects of life. I had people around me that were starting to move on, on alternative media, organized using social networks, and a lot were photographers uh, covering aspects that usually were not on, on, on traditional media. And I started seeing the power of that and also get interested in the... Started looking at pictures differently. I covered several Olympic Games, for example. It's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to to see firsthand uh, athletes uh, in action. I mean, that's that's just amazing. Then I covered like the, the first uh, Iraq war, for example. I was uh, in Amman when, when the, the first invasion uh, happened. The main action was in Baghdad. I was not in Baghdad, but I was... But the photographer who was in Baghdad didn't have any means to transmit the pictures. So he took the pictures and then he sent the uh, the rolls of film. At that time, there was no uh, digital uh, photography yet. And uh, he sent it back to me. And I, I, I had the immense responsibility of uh, developing the film and editing the pictures that were then uh, all over the world, you know, the bombings over Baghdad. It's not not my picture at all, but I had a, a role in, in helping show uh, the rest of the world what, what was going on. In fact, one of my many assignments as an 11-year travel writer was I was sent to Morocco and uh, did uh, you know some stories and photographs. When I uh, got a Fulbright to go to live in West Africa, I was able to pick up the lingu what they call a lingua franca or local language there very quickly. So that was a revelation. And then when I moved on to work in China, about a year later, I picked up Chinese and my Chinese is probably my best foreign language. Even now, when I go to China and write about it, as I, I did for uh, News Decoder a couple of years ago, when I moved around China, I was able to use my Chinese, you know, quite a bit, but I would never fully rely on my intermediate skills. You have to be real careful about that. Um, as, as you can imagine. Sometimes as a journalist, I feel I'm a bit like a diplomat. I'm building bridges between cultures. When I was working in Russia, I was helping Western readers to understand Russia. I was helping Russians to understand the West. You know, when, when you are in a meeting with heads of state or with religious leaders or social uh, protests, or there's a lot of... Uh, variety when you work in, in a news agency. Can you give me a little bit about what that piece is about? So uh, to put it simply, that piece is about um, a, a rural tribal person like me in an urban setting. OK, because when you look at the urban setting, it's more of uh, 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 attracting uh, global audiences. But then you're coming from this rural setting where it's different values and different traditions and uh, uh, different customs or maybe even cultural practices or traditional practices is, is, is the balance between being um, a tribal person in an urban setting. There's a lack of representation of people of color in medical illustration and scientific art. And the lack of representation could have both clinical and psychological implications. Um, most of the scientific art and illustrations you see are uh, majority um, European descent, and we rarely see um, people of other races and ethnicities, such as like Black, Asian, Latinx, Arab, uh, indigenous people. It, it matters that they also get represented as art because we, I mean, we have a world full of all different type of people, and they need their have they need to have their needs met for medical reasons. It's a wake up call for people to understand. The world is complex and we should we should be aware of different kinds of people everywhere and 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 we should cope up because it's no longer a remote world it's it's it's, it's connected interconnected yeah they decided to set up a commission that would investigate all the uh, state terrorism abuses that uh, had happened before that resulted in in thousands of people disappearing and uh, when the government decided to um, uh, investigate all that, they set up a commission. They needed a photographer. So that's when I became the official photographer of this uh, commission who investigated the disappear. 
and uh, that today it remains like the <laughs> the most important thing I did in my life. And I also felt very strongly about what I had read and and was seeing with my own eyes about the society and the, and the lack of freedom of expression and seeing some of people I knew disappearing week by week. And even their families didn't know where they were. They'd been seized and, and dis literally disappeared. This really got my, um, you know, my indignation going. I wanted to know the truth. And somehow I didn't get caught. Although one of my fellow uh, graduate students was arrested and imprisoned for spying, unfairly, actually. She was simply doing her PhD thesis. The article, in the end, is about the exclusion and discrimination that transgender people live in general. But in this case, it was about a specific moment where because of organized crime, dealings with sex work, uh, people were killed. Transgender women were killed uh, brutally. Uh, and, and the report was used in that moment and that, that this episode of violence, which is not very common at that level because you're talking about assassinations is, you know, you have the, the violence that is going on every day, but, and, but trying to show that this is like the stream phase of something that it's already going on and it's always kind of going on, right? That, that was the goal of, of, of how to frame it. In essence, about, it's about who owns Taiwan. Is Taiwan owned by Beijing and the Chinese Communist Party? Or is it owned by the Taiwanese people themselves? A race to save Ugandan, uh, Uganda's hippos. So uh, the character was Raymond, a ranger who we were running with for 21 kilometers. So he was getting a story from his perspective. What does it mean to be a ranger? What does this experience mean? The same, the same that came here to, 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 to put this very story about camera trapping. The characters in there, they are talking about um, what it means to use uh, the technology. Is, is, uh, would they be afraid because the uh, would they be afraid that the technology will take away their jobs because it's AI and it's doing most of the job, most of the tracking? Uh, is it is it in any way helping? Uh, so that's your character you're following. The story will be relatable to anyone because you you'd put yourself in that person's shoes. All of a sudden, I don't know why, but he he said something about. Yeah, you know, Roe v. Wade, um, that's probably had more impact on my life than anything else. So I thought, wow, this doctor has seen it all right on the front lines. And I pretty much made that, uh, you know, made him the focus of my story. Sometimes working as a journalist, I'm, I'm rather similar to an anthropologist going and living among people. Uh, speaking the language, living living their lives with them, at, almost as if when I was in Russia, I was living almost as if I was a Russian, trying as best I could to understand what it's like to be a Russian, to understand their culture. And um, so, yes, it, being a journalist involves being a psychologist, being a diplomat, being an anthropologist. It, there are many elements to it. And a good writing is, is only part of it. The third thing I did was, this happened on a weekend. On Tuesday, I get to know that people were going to go outside a precinct, and I went there. I went there, I go with my, my recorder, uh, and I start talking to people. You know, just talking to people. In journalism, the key thing is uh, the interview, uh, meeting with people who are relevant to an issue and who are willing to speak about an issue and meeting with people on both sides of an argument, not just one side. But to meet with people, you have to really uh, buckle down and uh, work hard and try and convince people uh, that it's worth their bother to, to meet with you. And so that's part of the fun of being of journalism, uh, you know, getting some important person who's willing to speak to you. So it's not an easy part of the job, but it's a rewarding part of the job when you succeed. Be persistent. Um... It's one, like I've mentioned earlier, it's a numbers game. Um, of course, when you're pitching stories, the reality is you're probably going to get more no's than yeses, but that should not uh, deter you from um, pitching that story. And then, of course, like if you're a student working in um, the sciences, um, if you can find a mentor that is on the same page as you about um, pushing your art the way you like it, that's going to help as well. 
So you never think, you're never afraid of kind of going outside the box or being yourself. That comes together with the, the huge responsibility of uh, showing the rest of the world what, what's, what's happening. Think about the person who's reading it, making sure that the article is clear and understandable uh, to them and making sure the article has a story that they can uh, absorb. Older people like me are happy to share their experience with younger people. And so you know, look for a mentor who can help you. Treat each article not just as a writing uh, process, but as a learning process too. Invest, uh, invest in the preparation. I remember someone told me uh, a phrase. I don't know whether it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know whether it's, it's the perfect uh, statement he said, but he said uh, when you're given six hours to cut down a tree, uh, use the first four to sharpen the axe, and then the last two to cut it down. So invest more time in invest more time in uh, preparation. Do your research. Understand what's needed, why it's needed, and why it's important to the story. I think that term story is very meaningful because an article must have a story. It must have a narrative. It must have a message. And so, yeah, you know, when you start preparing for a story, you need to do as much reading as possible uh, to find out about the background to it all. You have to meet with the people involved, but then you have to digest it and then come up with the story that you want to communicate. And uh, that's a challenge, but, uh, you know, it's fun to, fun to do. Because, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, when we're university students, you know, often we have to write an essay, we just write the stuff. We often don't think about the uh, person who's reading it. And as a journalist, the key thing is to be very curious and, uh, and you know, and record everything. Take notes, keep them, <laughs> and, and verify the facts yourself. People, people will have different opinions or different versions or whatever, but it's up to you to find your uh, vision. Do not underestimate... Uh how far the power and believing in yourself can get you. Sometimes we find out what our real gifts are when we're plunged into the environment. And certainly it's important for international reporting. So stay true to yourself, just keep pushing and you'll eventually get that story and get where you need to be. Mm -hmm.